Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about some new advances in photography that some people have called revolutionary and the ways in which this technology may affect all of us in the future. We're going to see a camera called the PiCam that uses something called computational imaging to take pictures that can be refocused after the picture has been taken and can also take three-dimensional pictures that can be printed on a 3D printer. My guest is Paul Gallagher, Vice President of Strategic Market Development at Pelican Imaging Incorporated, which is a leader in this new technology. Paul, welcome to the program. Good to see Marty. you today. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very glad to be here. We're going to start our conversation in just a minute, but first we have a short video which shows some of the features of the PiCam. Let's take a look. Imagine that your mobile phone has more than one camera. When you take a photo, depth information is captured at every pixel, so you can adjust the focus even after you take a picture. Easily making an amazing photo even better. You can focus on multiple subjects at the same time. And a shared photo contains all the information needed so anyone can download and edit from any device. You can even combine photos to create your own masterpiece. It's not about megapixels anymore. It's about a smart camera for your smartphone. Pelican Imaging. So that was a short video about the PiCam. Paul, what else can the PiCam do? What are some of the other capabilities? Uh, well, <clears throat> some of the other capabilities we have built into this is with the architecture, we actually uh, have better low light performance than you'd see with an equivalent design. Uh, and it's, it's based on the architecture. Uh, but fundamentally, one of, the, one of the main drivers for the architecture is the fact that it's about half the thickness of a conventional uh, camera in your cell phone. And this is a significant issue because the two cameras in your cell phone, the front-facing camera and the primary camera, pretty much now define the thickness of your phone. So this camera actually fits into a cell phone. It can go into your cell phone just as easily as the standard camera is in there. Yes, and as a matter of fact, as we'll show later on the tablet, that's exactly what we did. We took the camera out of this demo system and we replaced it with ours. I think we actually have a slide that shows just how big the camera is. Do we have that slide? There it is. Right, so as you can see, it's not much thicker than a quarter. Um, it's, it's on the order, uh, a conventional camera is uh, <clears throat> five to six millimeters. Uh, with this uh, architecture, we're looking at something that's in the 2.7 to three millimeter thickness. But how does it work? How do you manage to refocus a picture after you've taken it? Um, well, because what we have here is we have 16 low resolution arrays on a single chip, each with their own optics. And essentially an easy way to think of this is you get a bug's eye view. You get 16 views of the same scene uh, on the camera. And um, uh, from that, we process that to give you a high resolution image. Um, I think we actually have a slide on that. Um, and There it is. Right, and so what we're seeing here on the left side is the output from each of the individual subarrays on the chip. And then through our processing, we process this and provide a high resolution image. What is different about the 16 images except for the fact that they're a couple of millimeters apart? They're also a single color, red, green, or blue. In a conventional camera, they will have each pixel be a single color. And this actually it creates problems for color noise because the energy that goes into one pixel may be a red f uh, filter above it can get absorbed in a neighboring pixel, which may be a green filter. And when you process that, the system thinks that red energy is green energy. Uh, with the Pelican approach, each of the cameras is a single color. So if it comes into one pixel that's red and it goes into the neighboring pixel, that's a red pixel. So we get you much better color acuity. But how does it handle the depth part? Are they, does each uh, individual camera have a different focal length? So your image is going to be uh, and focus it in one of the 16 images? No, the way we do this is each of the cameras is in focus from 10 centimeters to infinity. 
and they all have the same field of view. What we do is we take advantage of parallax. So we find depth the same way your eye and brain do. Because each of the cameras is shifted in X and Y space, they have a slightly shifted view of the scene. And so what that does is the same as with your eyes, where each eye has a slightly shifted view of the scene, and from that you can get depth, we do the same thing. So you can select one portion of the picture and show that in focus and then select a different portion of the picture and show that in focus. Right, because we capture the whole scene in focus and we have depth for every pixel, if you select a point in the scene, what we do is we set that as the center of your depth of field. We then apply a virtual gradient blur equivalent to what you had set the lens to outside of that region because we've already captured that region in optical focus. And so we're adding blur outside of that region. Now let's say you took a picture and you emailed it to me. Would I be able to apply these features on it and bring different faces into different focus or, or do you need some special software to accomplish that? So the way we have this is we have a file format which is an extended JPEG. So the all in focus image is stored as a normal JPEG image. And then we embed the depth information in the header of the JPEG file. So that if you open it up with a regular JPEG viewer, you'll get an all in focus image. If you open it up with a viewer that goes through the Pelican API, you can then do all of these kinds of manipulations. So you can send it to someone, they can see the image, and then you can say, oh, you can, if you want to do more with this, you can go get this, this uh, uh, download. I think we have another short video which shows another aspect <coughs> of the Pi Cam. Can we see that next video, please? The camera inside your cell phone is getting smarter. With the next generation of smartphones, you can't take a bad picture. There is an integrated array of cameras, so every pixel is in focus. You'll never miss the perfect shot. Because every pixel contains depth information, you can select any two points to measure the distance between them. When you capture video, your phone or tablet can actually use the data to build a 3D model. What you do with that model is up to you. Create a digital avatar or plug it into a 3D printer to create a personalized gift. Use your creativity along with a smart camera in your smartphone to make every occasion more memorable. Imaging. And that was a video showing the three-dimensional effects of the Pi Cam. Now, Paul, how does it actually do that? Is it taking a whole bunch of pictures and figuring out the relationship to each other and kind of shaping them into a three-dimensional image? Um, exactly. So what we're doing is, um, as we can see on the, on the screen here, this is one picture that we then have turned into a three-dimensional model. And you can see, because of the different views of the cameras, you have a slightly shifted perspective. And so even from a single snapshot, we can present a three-dimensional view of a scene. Um, but what we can then do is, because each image captured, we know the exact position and orientation of the camera, because we can model back from all of the depth points. And so that as we move the camera around, we have a lot more richness of information to then stitch and create this rendered image. Is this basically taking video? Are you doing, say, 30 pictures a second in order to get this kind of image? Um, it can be either. It depends on if you want video, then your resolution is going to be video resolutions. If you want something of higher resolution, okay. then you would take a series of snapshots, maybe in burst mode. So it can support either. Okay. And what else do we have on this tablet here, some of the so, other demonstrations? Um, one of the things we have is we actually have the, uh, we have the camera embedded here in the tablet. So as I said earlier, uh, we took the existing camera that was in there out, we cut the whole square, uh, and then put our camera in. It directly interfaces uh, through the standard inter interface for uh, cameras and cell phones directly into the processor. Uh, so I can show you some of the things we can do with this um, system. So here is the image as we captured. It's an all-in-focus image. You can see everyone's in focus uh, from near to far. Um, one of the things we can do here is we can move the focus. Does it recognize a face and focus on a face, or does that not so, matter? Um, no, it doesn't matter at all, because what we're doing is 
we have a depth point for everything in the scene. So at this level, we're, we're saying un uniformly, the way a normal lens would do this, here is where the depth range is. Right? But what we could do is we could set structure it so that one person is in focus and the person next to them isn't. I don't have this image here, um, but we're also doing this non-destructively. So we can move the focus uh, from point to point. But one of the things we can do in this that you can't do in a normal camera is the person in the foreground is in focus and the person in the background is in focus, but the person in the middle is out of focus. So imagine you're on vacation in Paris and you stand by the Eiffel Tower and you take a picture of your spouse. And you've got the beautiful Eiffel Tower in the background, you've got your beautiful spouse in the foreground, and 200 sweaty tourists between. So you can actually have now an image where your spouse is in focus, and the Eiffel Tower is in focus, and everyone else is out of focus. And I understand that you can also cut pe people out of the picture and put them into other pictures. Right, so... Um, as we saw in that <coughs> very first video. One of the things we can enable is, let's say, uh, this image was posted, she posted this image in Facebook, and the other two uh, gentlemen here are tagged in it. So one of the things we can enable is because we have a, resol a depth map that's of the same resolution as the image itself, we have very, very finely defined edges. And so let's say this image got posted and, and uh, the gentleman at the top says, you know, I really don't like that other guy. Well, he can get rid of him. And repost the image this way. Now, perhaps she sees this and is a little freaked out. Well, she can go and just for fun, apply a little artistic. It's a lot simpler than Photoshop, um, I would say. It, yes, and, and, and what we're talking about is being able to do this with your fingers on your phone. I mean, people have, you know, the digital shoebox full of images that they'll get to someday to fix. If you could fix it as soon as you captured it, and it was easy, you didn't have to read the 300 page Photoshop manual, you're gonna see a lot of people much happier with their images. But also what this enables is a serialized editing of images. Right now when you capture an image and you send it up to Facebook, what's the result? Maybe somebody hits the like button, maybe they, hit, they write the equivalent of a Twitter comment. Oh, I like that image, right? Or I remember we were there. Now you can manipulate it. You can say, wait, I'm in the background. I want to pull myself into the foreground. Or I want to push that guy out into the background and behind somebody and repost it. You can add objects and they will scale correctly in the, in, in the scene itself. And you can create this much richer social engagement with the images you poach, post. You're also inventing images too. This would be great for uh, propagandists. Potentially, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, you remember back, you, uh, you know, in, in a movie you saw Tom Hanks pretty much shake every president's... Uh, like in the Soviet yeah. Union, somebody would be excised from the picture who was not in favor anymore. You could do that. Yes, yes. Well, how does this compare to a regular camera? Does this replace <coughs> a traditional camera, or does the traditional camera still do some things that you want to keep? Um, it depends on the market. It depends on the, on the product line. So, you know, the Pelican solution is very focused for the consumer space on small form factor cameras. So we're talking about uh, cell phones and, and tablets and laptops and, and TVs, uh, phablets, these kinds of, of opportunities. Um, I don't see this having a lot of play in, say, a DSLR space, because in a DSLR space, you go and you spend maybe $1,000 for your camera, and you put it in the bag that has $30,000 worth of lenses. Well, because our lenses are very different, that's a proposition I don't see in the short term being uh, one that's adopted. As it goes on over time, I see this as, as potential to support DSLR because now you can have all of this depth information and align it with the DSLR image. Uh, but that I see as, as a little staged a little farther out. We're, so right now we're focused very much on uh, the consumer space and the implementations in the consumer space. Now is the camera actually available or is it not quite on the market yet? It's not quite on the market yet. Uh, what we expect is we expect this to, uh, depending upon the customer because this is going into existing well-known brand platforms based on their when they bring things to market we expect this to be uh, late next year or early 2015. So if you buy uh, an iPhone in 2015 uh, it'll have this pre-installed instead of the current camera. Um, if you buy a phone, I don't want to pay oh, a wanna, particular right, okay. phone, but right. uh, you know, the, the, there is a, a smartphone. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're targeting the smartphone because of the processing power on the smartphone. Um, but yeah, there's there's a strong probability, possibility, um, that this will be in several 
different platforms. In terms of price, is this a lot more expensive than a traditional camera? It sounds um, simple, complicated to design, but simple in function. Um, yeah, it's uh, f right now it's a little more expensive because it's a much smaller base of suppliers. Um, you know, the Pelican is a software company. We're working with the existing high volume suppliers to make the particular chip uh, and the optics. And these are, these are companies that are shipping millions and millions of units a month. And they have the strong expertise and the capabilities on, on that side. Um, and we have a very small number of suppliers right now. And as that supplier base grows, we expect there's going to be stronger price competition. But it's basically software in that once you have these 16 images that are just slightly off because of parallax, then you can choose how you process them through the software. Right. Okay. So are there any additional functions that you can add to this beyond what you're doing now? And where do you see this technology going? Well, a couple of the things. The way we have the architecture designed, each of the cameras is individually controllable. And so what this means is right now if you have a high dynamic range capture on, an, on a, a smartphone, what happens is it takes a long exposure, and then the next frame is a short exposure. And then it combines them. But the issue is, this is two separate points in time that it does this. And I've actually seen from some very popular smartphones, people having eight eyelashes, because they blinked between the two captures. And this, you have these kinds of issues with, these, with this. With the Pelican approach, we can have some of the subarrays with a long exposure. And within that exposure, the other subarrays have a short exposure. So we combine the data all within a single capture time uh, to give you a, a significantly reduced uh, motion artifact issue. The other thing we can do is we can have each of the cameras operating independently. So if I, each of the cameras, I mean each of the 16 each of the, Yeah, each the of array. the subarrays in, in, the, in the solution can be operating independently. So if I want to capture a high-speed image, high-speed video for slow motion playback, let's say 200 frames per second. Um, if I want to do that, then that means the maximum amount of time I can have one frame running in a legacy camera is 5 milliseconds, as opposed to 30 milliseconds, which is normal. So that means it's six times less light per frame. With the Pelican solution, we can have one frame start with a 30 millisecond exposure, and the next frame five milliseconds later starts, and the next frame five milliseconds later, and the next one five milliseconds later, so that we can capture under the normal lighting conditions, because most high-speed imagery needs a lot of light. Um, and so where do, you see, where do I see this being used? Well, for, uh, on your phone, you're, you're uh, at Little League game, your son or daughter's up at bat, the pitcher goes, starts to throw the ball, you hit the high-speed mode, and you capture the swing at high speed and then you take it back out as they're trotting off to first base. And then you can play it back and you're not going to have any of the image degradation from having each of the frames be much shorter exposure. So you're doing video and <coughs> can you apply all these focusing effects on each frame of video? What, what if you want to change the focus on, and you have many frames? So yeah, so actually right now editing video is very difficult, right? Because you have to do it on every frame and there's not a lot of automation involved in that. Because we can isolate all of the objects in a very high resolution, you can actually track right through the video. You can trace things through the video. And also, you can start to do some very interesting things relative to someone being occluded in the video and then coming back in. So you're watching, uh, again, you're watching your kids play soccer, and they run behind someone. All right, now if you're focusing on them, you've lost them. Right? And then they come back out. Well, because you know where they were at the depth point when they come back out, you know where to look for them. Or you want to take a picture of them running up to the goal, right? With a legacy camera, you want to get them on one side and you want to get the goal on the other, and you do that, and the next thing you know, you're focusing on the lady across the, the field. Now you can select that person and you can track them in three-dimensional space. No matter where they move, you can keep them in focus so that you can move the camera. You don't have to hold them in the center of the scene. So you get a much richer engagement with what's actually happening in the scene. What about other kinds of applications for this technology? For example, medical imaging. Uh, X-rays today are kind of flat, not too much depth. They have devices which spin around the body and make little planes that a computer kind of assembles into a 3D form, kind of clunky to say the least. Uh, does this have an application in that type of realm? Uh, potentially. We see, uh, we see a bunch of different applications. Uh, some very interesting things for uh, living with dignity uh, for, uh, for cameras. Uh, as um, the population is aging and they want to stay in their homes, um, <clears throat> but you still want to make sure they're okay. And so doing things like predicting uh, the, the probability of, of someone to fall. Well, you can actually train a physician 
to watch someone walking and they can do a pretty good job after training of understanding the probability of this person to fall and get hurt. Um, you can train cameras to do that. If I have this in three-dimensional space, I can train that camera to do, very, to do this very well. Um, and as we look at those kinds of applications in other spaces, the security markets. There's a lot of cameras in security markets. There's not a lot of, of people watching them, however. And so there's a lot of need for good automated security. And whether this is home, whether this is at the airport, whether this is in your parking lot, you need to know there's people, not cats, not raccoons, but maybe not raccoons, but people that are going to do something. And you, 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 you have a problem with scale when you do these things. You have a problem with flashes of light or shadows fooling a legacy camera. When you have depth, you can pull this information out much easier. You can send much less data to be processed. And so you can spend more time on each frame with the part you care about. And as we extrapolate this out into applications like automotive, if we look at the automotive space, you see the Google cars riding up and down uh, Highway 85 and all over the area here. Um, <clears throat> so you see the trend is towards people starting to accept autonomous driving vehicles. You need a lot of information to do that because you're going to have about 30 years of autonomous driving vehicles and people driving vehicles on the road at the same time. So these cameras could actually serve as sensors judging speed and distance for oncoming cars and instantly feed that back into a computer based in the car right. and tell you what to do or unless the car is just doing all the driving itself. Well, even if the, car is doing, if the car is doing all the driving itself, it really needs to know what's going on. It needs to know that there's a pothole and you steer around it. It needs to know um, that the, the data that was taken relative to GPS doesn't apply today because two of the lanes are closed. Um, but also, as we look into the cabin, Right? Um, as we start looking into the cabin, I need to know where you are to have safer airbags. I need to know that you're paying attention to the road. A big problem right now is distracted driving. I want to be able to, hey, look back at the road, warn you. Right? If I can do a three-dimensional model of your face and I can understand where you're looking, I can understand, no, oh, you're looking at your text. You're not looking at the Well, you the have dash. a computer <laughs> that's figuring out if I'm looking off the road, basically. Right. But the issue is by providing the depth information, it significantly reduces the processing and significantly increases the accuracy. So some people have called this technology revolutionary. Do you see it that way? Do you think it's really going to make a big difference in how we live? Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, <clears throat> the potential here uh, for, for this type of application in terms of assisting how people engage with the computerized world around them and how the computerized world can now start to do a better job of understanding your intention. You really need depth to start doing that very well because you don't want to spend most of the power of your computer on your camera and processing. You want to minimize that so that all the other things you're doing on that computing system or on that, v on that smart car or with that smartphone aren't burning a lot of power just to understand what you intend to do. Now what was the key breakthrough that made all this possible? <laughs> was it just that Somebody came up with the idea that if you put 16 tiny cameras next to each other with 16 images slightly off, you could use software to assemble that into something very meaningful? Um, so actually there was a lot of work to come, with the, come up with the 4x4 architecture. We've looked at 2x2 and 3x3, 4x4, 4x5, 5x5. And from a cost performance point of view, the, the 4x4 winds up being well for the application of your primary camera in your phone. Other architectures would be better for, for other instantiations. Um, if you look back to you know, how this all started, um, the fundamental camera in your smartphone, the, the, the silicon, the semiconductor, the model's somewhat broken. Um, it doesn't follow Moore's law well anymore. It gets more expensive as you get smaller, much more expensive as you get smaller. If you think about it, the 13 megapixel uh, camera in your smartphone, that's 1.1 micron pixels. That's the cutoff frequency for light in silicon. So we're talking about pixels that are now approaching the frequencies of light. And you have a lot of problems with that that cause a, a lot of cost increases to be able to get good imagery. And so being able to step back and say, wait, you know, we look at what we did. We took a digital still camera design and we started banging on it and banging on it and banging on it till it got small enough to fit inside your phone. Well, that's not what nature did. What nature did was you have people have two large collection systems, just like a regular digital still camera. But if you look at small insects, things like that, they don't have two main eyes. They have many, many, many eyelids. 
and from that they produce an image. Now, you're talking thousands or tens of thousands. Well, that's fine for an insect, but we still have to represent an image that a person can find pleasing, so thousands or tens of thousands doesn't make a lot of sense to us. And I understand that the camera doesn't have any moving parts, so there's not much that could break. Right. Um, <clears throat> it is fixed focus, and it's focused from 10 centimeters to infinity. So what this means is we can capture the image much faster. Because as soon as the exposure level sets, which takes maybe about three frames, we're ready to capture images. If we look at the current system, the focus has to move until it finds the right focal point. We don't have to spend that time. So from power on to first shot, and then a shot over in the background, and a shot in the foreground, we can capture them almost instantaneously. Well, this makes photographers lazier. Right now, they have to make an effort to focus. Now they could say, we don't have to bother focusing because the picture will be just perfect no matter what we do. No, actually what I see is, you know, this is, as I said, this is focused on the consumer so that they can get what they meant to get out of the image. What I also see is this is going to really enhance what the photographer can do. It's going to make them much more efficient. Because even though you can do all of these kinds of things that we're showing here, it doesn't mean you will. You may still send these out to someone who has much more expertise in these kinds of things or much better tool sets to work with. So actually what I see is from a work product perspective, it, it's actually enabling the professional photographers to be able to take it that much farther. So do you see this pretty much replacing existing cameras, even among high-end professionals? Um, potentially over the long term. I think in the, in the short term, it's going to make it um, replace for the consumer level products and maybe an adjunct. We have about one minute left. Any final thoughts for the audience? Um, so if you look at it, this is the first fundamental change to the camera architecture in hundreds of years. And we're doing a lot of changing here. We're doing a lot of disruption, but we're not disrupting the supply chain. We're working with the existing suppliers. We're working with the existing players. We're working with the existing manufacturers. What we're disrupting is how you interact with the image, how the systems can now work with the images better, how to make sure you get a more pleasing image. Great. And I wish you all the best of luck with that. Thank you for being here. Uh, I've been speaking with Paul Gallagher from Pelican Imaging. Thank you for watching. Visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman, and we'll see you next time.